So good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this uh, very special event. My name is Michael Newman. I'm the chief executive of the AJR. It's very nice to see uh, lots of our members, some familiar faces uh, and colleagues and organizations that we work with. So thank you all very much for joining us. Uh, I'm going to keep my uh, remarks very brief because I'm going to hand over to my colleague Alex Moores, who's going to uh, chair the event. We really just wanted to take the opportunity to thank our speakers for finding time this afternoon uh, and to address this very important issue to, uh, to Karen Pollock, a former colleague, a current colleague of mine in the Holocaust Educational Trust, uh, to Lord Mann, thank you very much, and also to take this opportunity to pass on uh, my congratulations to uh, Ian, to Lord Austin, as he uh, has become our <laughs> elevation to the House of Lords. And thank you all very much for being on this panel this afternoon. Uh, and I hope that the, I think the idea is that we will have the opportunity later on for people to ask questions alongside those that Alex is going to be posing. Uh, and with that, uh, I just to thank my colleague Alex for comparing and chairing this event. And uh, with that, I will hand over to you. And I look forward to uh, viewing another successful AGR. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Michael. Um, for that introduction. Welcome to everyone who is joining us tonight. Um, I've just sent a, uh, a message in the chat box uh, saying if you have questions to direct them to me, as Michael said, but you can, you can easily find me that way. My name is Alex Moss. I'm the head of educational grants and projects at the Association of Jewish Refugees. Um, as many of you will know, because I think there's quite a few AJR members joining us tonight, but maybe for those who aren't, um, the AJR is mostly known for our social welfare programs for Holocaust refugees and survivors. Um, and you should learn more about those programs on our website, ajr.org.uk. And just to say, if you know of anyone who might benefit from any of our, our services, please do get in contact with us. Um, in addition to our social welfare work, we fund and occasionally create uh, educational resources and we fund quite a few educational programs. I suppose these events that we've been doing during lockdown fall under that uh, category of just uh, you know helping to bring interesting content to uh, to our members and to our friends out there during this uh, this time when otherwise we're not able to meet up in person. And um, I'm pleased to say it's been going pretty well. So this is the latest in uh, in a a long running series now over the past several months and we're very pleased to to be here and for you to be joining us tonight. One of our other functions um, at the AJR is that we advocate on behalf of our members and on behalf of I suppose our, our colleagues and the programs that we fund as members of the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. Um, I sit on the uh, committee uh, on anti-Semitism and Holocaust denial. So I suppose that's why I've been uh, asked to chair this event. And um, obviously the work of the IRA features very heavily in any discussion about anti-Semitism here in the UK. And hopefully that we'll get to touch on that a bit um, tonight. Uh, I'll just speak for a few minutes at the beginning to provide a bit of context for this discussion. And then I'd like to just you know, have an informal discussion amongst our guests who have a lot of very interesting things to say. I have some questions that I prepared, but the conversation can go wherever uh, they feel it, it's, it's leading. And then I will make sure we have some time at the end to answer at least some of the questions that you submit in the chat function. Uh, the Community Security Trust, who, as many of you will know, tracks and monitors anti-Semitism in the UK, and their most recent semi-annual report recorded 789 anti-Semitic incidents across the UK in the first six months of uh, 2020. Now, uh, I want to just quickly share my screen here to show you. Um, here is a CNN report that talked about that. Um, Some of the things that it discussed in that CST report were <laughs> reports of educational or religious online events being hijacked by anti-Semites with 
or with anti-Semitic content. Um, and it's also noteworthy that that figure of 789 anti-Semitic incidents was slightly down from previous years, possibly because for much of the first half of 2020, people were in lockdown, maybe giving uh, anti-Semites a bit less of an opportunity uh, to do their thing. Now, of course, um, that did mean that there was an uptick, however, in online anti-Semitism. Anti um, and these issues strike very close to home for us and for this event. You'll have noticed uh, when you signed up for this event that we had some strict security measures in place. We said that we would only send you the link uh, an hour beforehand. Um, that is because of this uptick in online anti-Semitism. It's also worth saying that we are meeting, uh, obviously, during a pandemic, uh, and anti-Semites always seem to find a way to tie sort of outbreaks of this sort or catastrophes to Jews. So here is, uh, here is an example from Twitter of someone talking about uh, how, isn't it strange that Israel seems to have developed a, a vaccine? This was a while ago. There isn't a vaccine, as we all know. There is rumored to be one for coronavirus. What a surprise, they say. You know, uh, you know, implying that probably it was Israel or the Jews who came up with coronavirus in the first place and then miraculously uh, came up with a, a cure for it. And then, of course, there are the, the very fact that we're all sitting in our homes and we're not gathering together for this is because we're concerned about uh, distancing as reasonable people would be. But not everyone is concerned about distancing. There, were, there was a rally, not uh, just a a week or so ago uh, in Trafalgar Square with a random jolly assortment of conspiracy theorists of all stripes uh, who, were, who were challenging our, the various measures that are in place to combat, combat anti-Semitism and it's uh, to combat coronavirus. And it's noteworthy that this included anti-Semites anti from both the right and the left sort of finding common cause, I suppose, uh, in, in this particular issue. And this, I suppose, highlights some of the, just the strange nature of anti-Semitism as it relates to today. So what is anti-Semitism? Um, you'll be aware of the IRA definition of it, or at least the existence of the IRA definition of it. I'm going to put in the chat box right now, just a link to the IRA definition for those who have not ever had a chance to actually read it. I'll put that right there. This is actually on the Campaign Against Anti-Semitism's uh, website, but it is the IRA definition. I would say, you know, when I give talks on anti-Semitism, I usually break it down into four main varieties. There's the one that deals with sort of wealth and greed and power and cons Jewish conspiracies to control the world. That's sort of one strand of, of anti-Semitism. Another is about allegations of disloyalty or dual loyalties that Jews have um, in whatever country they reside in. Another is Holocaust denial or distortion or anything that's on that spectrum. That might include trivialization or minimization or justification of the Holocaust. These are all manifestations of anti-Semitism. Another one that I, I always refer to, but I put a question mark after it, is anti-Zionism. This is obviously a, a hot button issue. Is it necessarily anti-Semitic to be critical of the state of Israel? No, absolutely not. You can, you can criticize Israel without uh, doing so in an anti-Semitic way, but anytime people criticize Israel in a way where they've taken the sort of classic anti-Semitic tropes and instead of applying them to Jews, they apply those same tropes to Israel, that would be anti-Semitic. Anytime that they uh, dish out collective responsibility for the actions of the state of Israel to all Jews, that would be anti-Semitic holding Israel to a different standard than they hold any other country. That would be anti-Semitic. There are paradoxes, of course, in all of these, these varieties of anti-Semitism. Anti-Semites believe, on the one hand, that Jews are sort of subhuman and, at the same time, all-powerful. Uh, they are puppet masters of, the, of capitalism and of communism at the same time. They are secret funders of the violent anti-fascists and also fascists. Now, these can't all be true at the same time, which highlights 
that anti-Semitism is at its core a conspiracy theory and uh, maybe shares a lot in common with other conspiracy, conspiracy theories, but unlike other conspiracy theories, it adapts and it morphs over time and different factions with different ideologies find new ways to make it serve their purposes or their agenda. It makes strange bedfellows, people who don't agree on any other issues, they find common ground, the so-called horseshoe theory uh, of, of anti-Semitism, where the, the left and the right sort of tend to meet up somewhere in the middle and, and uh, agree on one thing. So our task today is to try to better understand how it manifests itself today in 2020 and, and perhaps, hopefully, what we can do about it. And so I would like to welcome our esteemed panel. Uh, joining us today, we have Lord John Mann, who uh, uh, was a Labour MP for 18 years for Bassett Law and uh, was about a year ago became a member of the House of Lords. Welcome, Lord Mann. Uh, the reluctantly named Lord Ian Austin, he's still getting used to it, of Dudley, who um, has been a Lord for all of, what, one, one week, six days, something like that, uh, who served as a huh. Labour Member of Parliament for Dudley North. Welcome, Ian. And, uh, and Car Karen Pollock, MBE, who uh, has been the Chief Executive of the Holocaust Educational Trust for the past 20 years, and in the spirit of full disclosure, uh, I worked with her there for 10 of those years, so um, I don't know, it, maybe this is my, my big chance to, uh, to grill her in front of a public audience, finally get back at her for all of that, those 10 years. But uh, Karen is responsible for uh, some of the great Holocaust educational initiatives in the UK over the past generation, including the Lessons from Auschwitz Project, countless teacher training programs, and the Ambassador Program. So welcome, Karen. Thank now. Karen, I'm actually going to start uh, with a, a, uh, a slide that I want to show you and ask you to comment on, not this one, but this next one. I just saw in, was this week's uh, Jewish Chronicle, a story that you were quoted in. Um, yellow Star Holocaust t-shirts removed from Amazon, and everyone can uh, see an example of what's for sale right there. And uh, you, you commented on this, and I think you had some, some success in convincing uh, Amazon to take that down. Well done for that. But I was, I was hoping you could maybe start by putting this sort of thing into some context. You know, why is it that, uh, that you have to spend your time commenting on this sort of thing? How prevalent is this? Thank you, Alex. So firstly, just, Thank you for hosting this. Thank you to AJR and to Michael and to Andrew, who I saw somewhere on the screen. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here and certainly an honor to be on a panel with both Lord Mann and Lord Austin. Um, I also, I hope you don't mind, but I had a quick look around um, on the screen and I'm so happy to see many of the Holocaust survivors um, that we work with. So I've seen Tommy, Marla, Vera, Eva, Ruth, um, as well as many of um, our great colleagues and um, our educators who we work with and many in the Holocaust education sector. It really is lovely to see you all and congratulations AJR for bringing us all together and for this whole series. But let's go to the crux of the question. I find it remarkable that I would say if not on a weekly basis, regularly we find we're not looking for these things, but we stumble across these inappropriate items, whether it's on Amazon or elsewhere, when um, the Holocaust is somehow being used for, whether it's mockery, whether it is uh, deliberate distortion, or whether it's just bad taste. Um, the t-shirt that some of you uh, will have seen in that article has a yellow star and it says Yuda on it. And I think it was only three weeks ago, Amazon was selling masks. So masks for the COVID to prevent spreading COVID. Um, and the mask had an image of the Holocaust on it. And the notes around it on Amazon were something to the effect of to remember the Holocaust, remember this serious uh, tragedy of our past. I mean, who in their right mind is going to wear a mask to prevent um, this terribly serious disease uh, with a replica of Auschwitz or of a scene from the Holocaust. Um, 
it's pretty extraordinary. And Alex, I remember not so long ago, I think you or somebody raised with you uh, some t-shirts were on sale or somewhere in the Southwest, I think. Again, um, depicting uh, the Holocaust as some sort of emblem or logo. So this isn't new. It's happening all the time. Um, and the question is, I'm afraid I've forgotten your question, Alex, but my question is sort of why? Um, are people doing it for attention? Um, they like, they caught the controversy. They like um, getting some sort of a, you know, by, by us drawing attention to it, does it increase their sales? I've got no idea. But what bothers me is that when a company like Amazon are happy and comfortable having these sorts of items on their site, they say that there are guidelines, they say that there's a framework, yet this isn't the first time. I, I can't remember when it was, I feel like it was over six months ago, we raised um, Holocaust propaganda that was being sold on the Amazon site and we wrote to Amazon, it became a, quite a big story. Um, months later, we go back onto that site and those items are still there. So they're removed temporarily and they come back or not to see memorabilia. It's a very strange world. And to us, those people on this call, I think we can't imagine why people would have the idea of selling a cushion that has a picture of the Holocaust and why anybody would want to buy it. But I think it's our job and certainly at the Holocaust Educational Trust, every time we have to call it out, we have to say that it's in bad taste, we have to explain why, and um, ultimately, you know, we can have a battle, but we also need to educate. We also need to sort of explain why something like this is untouchable uh, for those sorts of, for, for something so banal as a t-shirt or a mask. The, the, the point that you made about the mask, I, I'm sure it's disingenuous when they said, you know, wear a mask to help remember the Holocaust because so many people, uh, not so many, but there is this sort of fringe element, I suppose, who, you know, like to compare the, you know, the, atrocity of having to wear a piece of cloth over your face to that, you know, what, you know, in the indignity suffered by the Jews at the hands of the Nazis. It's like, it's, you know, comparing one to another. And so, you know, it, it's, uh, it's completely disingenuous that they would imply that that was some form of, you know, memory or commemoration or something like that. Completely, yeah. completely. It is disingenuous. Absolutely. Um, I want to, I'll show another example. Um, John Mann, I'm going to show, uh, put it, another uh, slide up on the screen here and just to provide a bit of context. So here are some images of that, that we're doing uh, the rounds in the media several months ago of um, some carnivals in Europe. There are two from the carnival in Belgium and one from Spain where you see, um, you know, people who were marching through the streets uh, in a party-like atmosphere uh, dressed, you know, in these sort of caricature Jewish outfits, but with, you know, spider legs, Jews as vermin. And then at the same time, they have, you know, so they're sort of dancing Nazis and, um, and just, you know, other sort of very, you know, horrible, horrific uh, images of Jews. There's one that I didn't even think it was appropriate to show of people sort of dressed up as Holocaust victims. Is, it seems like, you know, when I read more about these articles, the the point that they were making was the theme of these carnivals is that we're we're poking fun at at the powerful and the influential and so there's this sense that anti-semitism you know this perception that anti-semitism is sort of like an acceptable form of prejudice because it's punching up not punching down is that a a perception that that you would you know agree is part of the problem or how would you characterize the the bigger picture of you know of anti-semitism yeah, of course it's uh, of course it's part of the problem, um, and this this concept um, we've heard it from uh, infamous remarks by anti-Semites who start off by going about the rich Jews, right. um, and this concept that there's a very powerful group of people wielding their power um, is is long-standing in terms of the imagery of anti-Semitism. But behind that are the, the conspiracy theories. And the conspiracy theories have certainly been around for the last 150 years. They are multiplying these days. I think the internet 
is a reason why they can multiply because they can be shared and spread and we're seeing the far right and the far left extremists of both coming together under a banner that uh, somebody's doing something evil and that's why we've got this uh, current crisis and oh look in the middle of it must be the Jews and Israel um, and profit and you bring the, 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 the three together uh, and the, the conspiracy theorists go wild and they have done and it's very very dangerous I'm just doing a piece at the moment for government on the link between anti-vaxxers mm. and anti-semites I mean two and the same repeatedly and it's extraordinary how often if you look at the uh, the discourse amongst the anti-vaxxers how people throw in the crudest anti-semitism almost, almost randomly into their discussions what's uh, an example oh there's lots of examples of that both from the far left and the far right um, of suddenly either blaming Israel Israel's profiting from uh, creating coronavirus in order to create the vir uh, the vaccine in order to profit from it that's one that's done the rounds on both the right and the left in many languages and in many parts of the um, uh, the world or that there's just some kind of general conspiracy out there and therefore it's been spread by the Jewish media to try and take people's freedoms away from them um, and and stop people living their normal lives which again brings the far right and the far left together uh, and many of these demonstrations so it's kind of uh, the Jews uh, 5G and vaccines um, and, and, and sometimes in the middle of it not as a linkage Bill Gates and George Soros which rolls right back in immediately with Soros back into anti-Semitic tropes yet again mm. you've, you've, you've touched on uh, so many different points there that I hope we'll be able to get to I mean in particular uh, the point about the spread of anti-Semitism on the internet and, um, and these sort of you know the the Soros element which highlights a much more um, pervasive theme of anti-semitism so let's see let's park those for the moment and hope that we have time to come back to that I want to come to uh, to Ian Austin and I suppose talk about the uh, the proverbial elephant in the room which is obviously the the reason that anti-semitism has been in the public discourse in Britain for the past couple of years, I shouldn't say the reason, but one of the primary reasons has been because of, of the Labour Party, a party that uh, both you and Lord Mann, you know, ha has spent quite a number of years as members of and then decided it was not your a home for you anymore. Um, there's this sort of fallacy that anti-Semitism is just like other forms of racism. You could sort of take out, you know, one marginalized or oppressed group and, and put in Jews and you're basically talking about the same thing then therefore if you're anti-racist you can't be anti-semitic and in fact it sort of seems like anti-semitism is the one acceptable form of racism it would seem for many people who call themselves anti-racist and this is something that you definitely butt your head up against quite a bit uh, when you were a member of parliament can you talk a little bit about your experience and and how that played out well, I was appalled, Alex, that um, a political party that so many of us joined to fight racism and which had such a proud track record of fighting racism and which many people in the Jewish community had instinctively supported for decades. I was absolutely appalled that, uh, that a party with a record like that could become the source of such offence uh, to the Jewish community and that um, and that under its leader under Jeremy Corbyn I felt it had become poisoned by racism I felt that he had said and done things which were racist themselves himself and I felt that um, I thought that it was I think the worst thing for me was that young people who regarded Jeremy Corbyn as this sort of virtuous political leader. He's not like all these other politicians. He's a really good guy. He's been on the side of the oppressed all his life. How can these allegations of anti-Semitism be true? 
And I felt that they were being sort of sucked into racism, that racism that was, um, and I thought this sort of poisoning of young people's minds was really the worst aspect of all of this. And I felt as well that you look at some of the things that were happening, Jewish women MPs being told they didn't have human blood, people like Luciana Berger being bullied out of the Labour Party, Margaret Hodge being targeted for disciplinary action because she dared to uh, complain about it. Senior figures like uh, Ken Livingston um, talking about Hitler being a Zionist. Other people coming out with age-old stereotypes about Jewish people controlling the, uh, the slave trade. Um, the point you made earlier on, your sort of fourth point about anti-Zionism, as a sort of obsession with Israel. I mean, really an obsession. Uh, they hold Israel to standards. They would never hold other countries. They used to blame Israel for every problem in the Middle East. Um, I mean, when they say, oh, I'm not an anti-Semite, I'm just anti-Zionist. Who do they think lives in Israel? <laughs> who do they think lives there? Mm. And if the only country in the world you want to get rid of is the only Jewish one, don't tell me you're not an anti-Semite. Don't tell me you're not a racist. Right. Yes, very well put. There's, there's this other element in, in that whole, what do we, saga, I suppose we call it, um, that is, it was this sort of like meta anti-Semitism where there is this suggestion that Jews were somehow benefiting from from these accusations of anti-Semitism that you know Jews were making these allegations because they had something to gain from it other than just being less discriminated against which really it, it rubbed so many of us the wrong way and um, you know I, I could I could imagine that was you know that must have been just sort of one of those odious things that that you had to deal with quite a, a lot. Is that is that the case? Yeah, I think. Well, look, this this uh, when you well, firstly, when you say I had to deal with, I mean, it's not about me and what I thought. I thought it was, you know, as an MP, I stood with Muslim constituents when the EDL or the BNP came to Dudley. And I felt my responsibility as a Labour MP was to stand with the Jewish community when they were uh, subjected to this. But your point is definitely true because if you look at so many of the responses in the Labour Party to complaints about anti-Semitism in the Labour Party, so many people would say things like, it's because he's, it's because Jeremy is challenging the rich and powerful. Um, it's because, you know, they saw it in those. And if you look at recently, Jeremy's, one of Jeremy's strongest supporters, a guy called Andrew Murray, who was the chief of staff, who is the chief of staff at Unite and worked sort of part time for Jeremy Corbyn and part time for Unite. He said, he did this interview where he said that, um, uh, that, that, that Jeremy Corbyn did not empathize with Jewish people because they are, quote, relatively prosperous. Yeah. He said that, he said that Jeremy Corbyn was empathetic with the poor, but that is happily not the Jewish community in Britain today. He said, this is incredible. He said Jeremy Corbyn would have had massive empathy with the Jewish community in Britain in the 1930s. Um, but of course, the Jewish community today is relatively uh, prosperous. So the truth about people like Jeremy Corbyn is that they don't object. They see themselves as being on the side of Jewish people who are being murdered by the Nazis. But they, when it comes to Israel, for example, they, they can't see themselves as being on the side of Jewish people who stand up for themselves. And they, and they draw this, as you say, this distinction between different victims of racism. And I think, look, if you regard yourself as an anti-racism, anti-racist, you're against racism, full stop, whether that affects Jewish people or black people or Muslim people. And you've got to know, I think, in this, uh, uh, on this issue, whose side you're on. Mm. Very good, thank you. 
Um, okay, so let's talk about social media. Karen, you're very active on Twitter. I, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll log on, I'll see, oh, there's some people piling on Karen on Twitter. Let's, let's uh, make a cup of tea, settle in and, <laughs> and enjoy the show because you can definitely hold your own. Um, but uh, how do we compete? How do we collectively uh, combat the spread of anti-Semitism uh, on social media, given how unregulated it is. Obviously, you work at the Holocaust Educational Trust. Is education any match for that sort of thing, or what do you see as as the answer? Well, firstly, I would say that um, for our audience, you know, I often remind myself, and certainly say to friends, that Twitter is not real life, and also that Twitter can often become a bit like an echo chamber. So I uh, have people who follow me and that I follow, but actually we think a lot similarly. And um, it's rare that we are uh, have diverging opinions. And um, that doesn't mean, as you say, that there aren't moments where um, I may draw attention to something that is anti-Semitic and as a result, have lots of people telling me why it isn't. Um, and that can go on for days and, you know, Honestly, I remind myself all the time that this isn't real life. That doesn't mean that it isn't, it can't be harmful. It doesn't mean that it isn't spreading uh, malicious lies, whether it's Holocaust denial and distortion outright, or whether it is blatant anti-Semitism. I think the most recent example that we can look at is, um, you know, perhaps people on this, uh, in our audience weren't um, familiar with grime artists, but since Wiley, um, who a musician, a rapper, grime artist, uh, became more well known for a tirade of anti-Semitic remarks on Twitter and Instagram, lasting nearly 48 hours, uh, being allowed to say the most despicable things, really it was incitement, it wasn't just opinions, it was aggressive. Um, and Twitter and social media, Instagram, just left it all up there. There was no intervention for a very long time. And it raises the question, he had something like 500,000 followers, I think, on Twitter, um, which I think, or on Instagram. I remember saying, you know, that's more than the number of Jews in this country. Um, you know, in terms of who he was influencing, he also had other famous grime artists, again, perhaps not people that we're familiar with, who were supporting him and aligning themselves with him. And what you really worry about is not, it's not about that one individual, it's about the impact that he is having on a community that rate him highly, that think he's a cool guy, and that want to follow and share his opinions and views. And so that's when the framework and how social media operate comes into question. Um, when should they intervene? Is it What's the point of having a policy saying, you know, we're going to, you know, anti-Semitism is wrong, racism is wrong, if you don't actually remove somebody from a platform or stop them airing their anti-Semitic and racist views when they're doing so for hours on end? I mean, John Mann is far more of an expert on this than I am, and he recently um, ensured that the Jewish community leadership we were able to meet with the Secretary of State for Culture, Media and Sport. Um, and that was very much to discuss what can be done, what is the framework with legislation that should be coming up before the end of the year. And I'm sure John can say more about that. Um, the point we've really got is, I think social media companies have a responsibility. Just like I think Amazon has a responsibility, if they're going to be uh, profiting from the sales of all sorts of things, they have to intervene when inappropriate items are on their sites. I think that also goes for social media. In any corporate, in any company, we would expect that there are certain values that um, companies uh, share, that people sign up to in terms of employees as well, and that there are lines. And when you cross them, um, you have to be you know, it has to be drawn, drawn out, but it also has to be stopped. Of course, I believe in freedom of speech. Of course, I think social media has a positive potential. Um, you can have a positive impact and make a positive impact. But I just think there does need to be some sort of framework and liability. Yeah, I, I mean, it is worth saying that Wiley, the musician that you're referring to, was 
kicked off, I think, permanently from all the main social media platforms. So there is a certain threshold that if you cross that, you will be banned. But it's pre- the bar is pretty high to get kicked off. And the, you know, what will it take to get Facebook, Twitter, some of these other platforms to to modify their terms of service and so and to enforce them so they actually have teeth? That's that's a pretty tall order, isn't it? Yeah. Although, I mean, what I would say is he came off. Um, Twitter and then had a new identity. He came off Instagram and then went onto YouTube. I mean, it was a series of, you know, I kept on getting messages from people saying he's on again, he's doing it again, you know. So there were ways to beat the system for quite a while. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I want to follow your your point about about pol- uh, you know addressing this at a policy level is is a good segue, and I want to come back to John Mann, um, the campaign against anti-Semitism. Uh, Lord Mann, in their research, I think it was a couple years ago, found that thirty six percent of British adults believe that uh, believe at least one anti-Semitic s- stereotype that was put to them to be true, and one in three British Jews has considered leaving Britain in the past couple years uh, due to anti-Semitism. So are can we, are these the sorts of challenges that can be addressed at the policy level? And if so, how? Oh, and you're on mute because I muted you when there was a siren going past. You're, you're very welcome to speak now. There you go. If you unmute yourself. Uh Oh, I've silenced Lord man. Do you see something asking you to unmute yourself, John? Well, this is awkward. Just trying to unmute him as well, Alex. Yeah. I'll tell you what, while we work on that, I'm going to put that same question to Ian Austin. Ian, do you think that these sorts of challenges are ones that can be addressed at the policy level? I think certainly, I think certainly governments have got to get to grips with this whole social media issue. I mean, it's a, uh, um, you can't have a situation where people can go on Twitter with completely made up identities anonymously, pumping out all sorts of virulently racist material, uh, where young people, children have got access to this. Um, I mean, we wouldn't allow people to sort of set up an unregulated railway uh, uh, radio station and pump out virulent racism, why should they be allowed to do it on on social media? This idea, as Twitter claim, that they're not a publisher, I just think is complete nonsense. Um, they're clearly completely incapable of regulating themselves. They don't take complaints nearly seriously enough. As Karen said, they allowed Wiley to pump out sort of aggressive threats for days before they uh, dealt with it. Uh, so I think they failed completely to regulate themselves and I think governments have, have got to get a grip. The other point, Alex, if I can just make a slightly different, well, a different point in response to the statistics you had from the campaign against anti-Semitism, who I think do brilliant work. And uh, clearly the statistics are very worrying. But I do think as well, we should recognise the uh the response by the british people generally to anti-semitism at last year's election now look it, clearly the election was mainly about brexit and there were lots of reasons why did why people didn't vote for jeremy corbyn but there is no doubt that one of the factors behind the labor party's worst defeat for 85 years uh was ordinary British people's revulsion at, uh, at, the, at anti-Jewish racism in, uh, in, in, in the Labour Party. And even in a place like Dudley, a uh, community with no Jewish people at all, people would stop me in the street and talk to me about this. They were absolutely appalled about what was happening. And it was definitely one of the reasons why British people didn't vote Labour. And I think we should be really, really proud of that. Really proud that ordinary, decent British people, when it came to it at last year's election, they knew whose side they were on on this. And one of the reasons why they voted, why, why they switched from Labour was because of their uh, disgust at anti-Semitism. Mm. Maybe, maybe just to add to that as well, um, I'm hoping 
John is uh, rejoining us in some way so that we can hear him. Um, yeah, I've, I've sent a couple of messages just so you know, in the hope that- We've um, lost it, Lord Mann, I'm sorry. Yeah, just so that he can, he can come back, but we'll, we'll wait. But I, I just wanted to add um, something about um, decent people. I think, you know, when this grime artist Wiley posted all these things, it led to this 48 hour campaign of silence on social media. It was led by grassroots, just individuals, including um, some of you will know Tracy Ann Overman and others who were just saying, you know, enough is enough. But to me, what was interesting about it was that um, we saw a lot of other uh, key figures join in and just say, you know, we've got to say no to anti-Semitism as we would to, to racism. And it, one of the lessons, if you like, whether we're talking about labor and anti-Semitism or we're talking about anti-Semitism and racism in, gen in general, I really believe in allyship. I really believe that we have to uh, educate each other, understand each other, that we're not, we can't be an insular community and only understand ourselves. We have to understand others and we have to build bridges. And we need other communities to know that we are also on their side, that just like we want people to stand with us against anti-Semitism, we also stand with them against whether it's um, prejudice, against whichever group. Um, I, I really believe it. And I think something I would say coming back to the work that I do on a more regular basis um, at the Trust is that we work with young people and they are from all walks of life, from all across the country, the majority of whom are not Jewish and most of them haven't met a Jewish person in their life until they hear from a Holocaust survivor in a school or when they get more involved with us as an organization. And what I really sort of am inspired by is that they just think as decent people that we should remember. They think as decent people, we should remember the individuals that were murdered, but also say no to anti-Semitism today. And they've got no reason to, they've got no obligation, but just because they get it. Um, and I think that should be a positive message in that we can talk, you know, the theme is to talk about anti-Semitism and it can be quite depressing when, in particular, when you see some of the COVID conspiracies that were referred to earlier as well. It's like, it's never ending, isn't it? Or the t-shirt on Amazon, it's just, when will it stop? The answer is, it probably won't stop, but there are a lot of people who are on our side and, you know, Ian and John are really brilliant examples of that too. Excellent. And I've got good news. We have, we have found John Mann. He has returned from the void in the space-time continuum where he disappeared to. <laughs> I, hope, I hope so. Uh, <laughs> there you, you are. Hear me now. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So um, I could hear everything. And then when you asked me to speak, oh, everything froze. <laughs> that, is, that is the reality of our, uh, of our world this, this year. But I refuse to be silenced. <laughs> no, no, no. In fact, the next <laughs> question's for you. Um, <laughs> I wanted to, uh, I think that one of the, the themes that links a lot of what we're talking about is, you know, many people don't exactly know what anti-Semitism is, and yet they feel that they do. Um, and there is a way that they could learn more about what anti-Semitism is. It's that thing I referred to at the beginning in Circulate Everyone, which is the IRA definition of anti-Semitism. Many people know, if they only know one thing about the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, it's that bloody definition um, that became so such a, a, a talking point for, for several months there. I'm wondering how can, uh, you know, as, as uh, a member of the House of Lords, you know, someone who's been uh, in a member of parliament for so many years, you know, how can we make better use of a definition like that so that it has a real influence on how people understand anti-Semitism, how we are able to address anti-Semitism in our society? Do you have well, any it, thoughts it, on that? Well, it, it's fundamental. And it's fundamental because it's a working definition. It's not a legal definition, which sounds like a lot of gobbledygook initially, but it's a vital difference. And you know, I've worked with this. I had three international conferences of parliamentarians where we, uh, we adopted and supported the definition going back to 2009 and kept it alive. And the reason for that is it was my view that if you can't specify a problem, how can you expect other people outside the Jewish community to do anything about it? And by specifying it, 
it becomes the handbook for action. So the first organization in the world to use it was the, the British police through the College of Policing in training police officers how to understand what was and what wasn't anti-Semitism. And it was hugely powerful in building linkage, for example, between the police and the CST, in the police understanding what anti-Semitism was. And its usage is primarily, in my view, outside of government and politics. I mean, governments have adopted it, but politicians come and go. Football clubs have started adopting it. So Chelsea Football Club was the first to adopt it. You mentioned social media before. Chelsea Football Club reaches 500 million people through their social media. 500 million. I mean, eat your heart out, Donald Trump. I mean, this is, this is mega numbers. And as part of their values, they've adopted it. But not as a statement, but as a working practice. So for how they train their and educate their staff, their players, all their staff, for how they educate their stewards, keeping order at football matches, for how they deal with their spectators at matches, for how they try and educate that reach to 500 million people. And they're not the only one. I mean, other football clubs in this country have adopted it. And I don't just predict, I, I, it would be wrong of me to, to, to break their own media embargoes and their own PR, but I can assure you that very many major other football clubs in this country are going to adopt it, many, and then across the world. And That's good news. That ought to be very positive and affirmative for the Jewish community. But, but what it does is it takes the battle of anti-Semitism exactly where it needs to be. You know, who is the anti-Semite out there? The anti-Semite out there is often a little Billy No-Mate stuck in his bedroom who's managed to be empowered because he can connect up with a Hans No-Mates and a Joachim No-Mates. And suddenly they feel there's more than them spewing out these racism. But Billy No-Mates will wear a football shirt. They'll have a badge. They'll have a love of loyalty. And that badge from Chelsea Football Club is saying, Billy, if you're part of Chelsea, don't be an anti-Semite. Don't be a Nazi. Don't be a racist. Now, if that then becomes every other major football club, the power of that is huge. But we go beyond that then. Every university needs to adopt it in this country. Every university. So that I can say to any Jewish kid thinking of going to university, your university will be safe for you. Here's what you can do if you've got even the smallest of problems. Here's the proof that they understand anti-Semitism and will deal with it. And so it's going to be a battle, but we'll get every university. The, the local authorities, already two-thirds of local authorities have adopted it. And the number's increasing rapidly. And it's authorities like the one I live in, Bassett Law. Obviously, I have a little bit of influence there. But I've only ever found six Jewish people living in Bassett Law. Anti-Semitism is not a big problem for them. I suspect I'm probably pretty much the only person, because they've told me, who knows they're Jewish. So it's a nice signal for them. But what it means is that local authority in its practices can make sure no one says anything stupid, ignorant, prejudiced without some consequences. And also, it's much more likely they'll be able to attract the best brains, the best talent from the Jewish community if they've got a job going. So it's a win-win. And what I want is consistency of approach and consequences every time for the anti-Semites. And the definition's critical to it. So thank you, Alex and others on IRA. I don't think you quite know what you've done. No, um, it but, makes, it's great to hear you say do. that. But we do. Thank it's, you. 
it's absolutely where the world's at. Very good. Well, it's great to hear you say that. Uh, funny enough, Michael Newman and I were just on a epically long Zoom meeting today for the IRA Committee on Anti-Semitism and Holocaust Denial. And one thing that always comes up is the struggle of the other 30 uh, odd member countries in IRA to get their, you know, their governments, their ministers to take it seriously and to put some teeth into this definition that we work so hard to agree upon. And it really is the case that Britain stands as a shining example of, of how to do that. And I really, you know, thank well, you don't, for all Well, don't that. underestimate the power in football in this, because I can tell you, a very major German football club is about to publicly announce it's adopted the definition. Uh, in fact, they're, they're, I think they're waiting for a quote from me uh, <laughs> before they publicise it. So uh, that's about to happen. You heard it here first, Italian. people. You're amongst friends. Who is it? A, 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 it's a very it's a very popular one okay very um, famous italian club i think is going to do so i'm confident many german clubs will very good we've approached major french add. clubs major spanish clubs major dutch clubs and i'm confident there as well one Brilliant. thing to add to john's point about football clubs and particularly about chelsea football club that i think is worth sharing um when they started their say no to anti-semitism campaign we organized for a Holocaust survivor, Harry Spiro, to share his testimony with the first team. And it was, share, it was shared on the main screen in the stadium afterwards. We did a video about it. And all these, the, the, the members of the squad were just blown away by his testimony and were extremely, extremely respectful. And seeing them, um, seeing the impact it had on them had an impact on people who were standing in the pitch watching the match. But something else anecdotal to share is that Chelsea really do take this seriously in terms of what is going on on the stands. So if there have been incidents that they've witnessed and stewards have got guidelines how to deal with anti-Semitic incidents on the stands at the pitch, they intervene. And I was asked to join um, really, I don't know what you can call it. Is it reconciliation or is it education? It's a combination. Um, but somebody who had been found guilty of being anti-Semitic, uh, making a woman and her son very uncomfortable at a match, and him being shown the footage of him behaving appallingly, and then show, been showing the film of Harry Spiro and various other educational resources and understanding why it's offensive. And I then joined this meeting where he told me how mortified he was, how he's embarrassed by it, that he understood the shame that he brought to the football club as well. It was quite, it was fascinating because he seemed to be going on a bit of a journey. I mean, it's, you know, he, he I, I think he couldn't believe that he was guilty of doing that, but he'd done it, he'd had a few drinks, but actually what individuals, they're not just, um, you know, giving them, sort of a tap on the wrist and saying you know you shouldn't do that again they're going on some sort of educational mission i mean we've organized for a whole group um over 150 uh chelsea club uh, football club supporters visit, visited auschwitz with us i mean this is meaningful work very good um that's great everything that you're doing uh with that football initiative is fantastic so thank you karen um we've We've, we're running short on time. I do want to get a few questions in that I, I've got here in the uh, in the group chat. Um, a few people have uh, have linked uh, this topic to education, so don't go anywhere, Karen. Um, Lillian Levy writes: Anti-Semitism surely originates from ignorance. School children are taught of Jewish suffering in the 20th century. They should be taught Jewish history over the last two millennia, uh, the, this, the dispersion from one country to the next, the re restrictions on work and residence. And I think that's a, a very good point about learning more about the history of, uh, of Jews rather than I suppose just Jewish suffering. Uh, Anthony writes, education works over the years, het, that's you, Karen. Uh, ambassador program has created an army of tremendous young advocates, a great example um, of one regional ambassador who he cites, who has recently set up a youth-led movement called Yet Again. Many of the founding members are had ambassadors. So th this goes back to a question that I asked earlier, but I it was, you know, in the context of lots of other stuff that I said. So 
I suppose, does learning about the Holocaust help make our society less anti-Semitic? I, we're very clear at the Holocaust Educational Trust. We would not say learning about the Holocaust is a panacea to anti-Semitism. Absolutely not. I do agree, I think one of the comments you had near the beginning, that it would be extraordinarily helpful if young people in schools really did understand Jewish history that predated the Holocaust. But like with all sorts of subject matters, there is only a certain amount of space and time um, and um, that you can really to, to, to various subjects in schools. It's just how it about the Holocaust doesn't transport even. We learn about pre-war Jewish life. We actually learn about thriving Jewish communities, their cultures, their families, their hometowns across, across Europe. Um, but it's only a taster. Um, but I do very much believe that, you know, you have to fight ignorance and hate with education. Uh, you have to start somewhere. And I think young people are not born um, and aren't uh, educated in schools. There's not an, an innate racism. They're picking things up. They're exposed to things, whether it's on the Internet or whether it's in certain, um, you know, uh, communities or whatever. But it's not it's not something that comes from them as individuals. So we have an opportunity. Excellent. Um, one more question. We're going to squeeze in one more, I think. Um, Alan asks, uh, at the top of the, um, of the program today, I showed the examples of the, the folks marching in offensive costumes and, and carnivals. Um, I think this is going to be for John and Ian. He says, these two examples you provided were from Europe. Um, do you feel that the UK's influence in Europe will have a will have diminished from us leaving the EU and so having an impact on such anti-Semitic incidents. I'm going to add one more element to that, which is it's not just random folks attending carnivals, but, you know, we have governments, Karen, I know this is something you've been involved in, like Poland, that have these laws that seem to distort the Holocaust, which, as we've said, is a form of anti-Semitism. Are, are we, you know, is there a concern, uh, Ian, I'll start with you maybe quickly and then to John about, you know, the, the reality of Brexit means that we'll have less leverage to have an influence on this in other countries. I think John's probably better placed than I am to, to talk about the ARA definition and other European countries and all that. I, but I just wanted to add a thought to the last question and answer, if I could, which is sure. that the... It's because people like Marla and Eva, who are on this call today, you know, have been to Dudley, working with Het, to speak at a Holocaust commemoration that we have, where over 400 people come, one of the biggest now in the country. The reason people in Dudley were so appalled about anti-Semitism is because they've heard survivors speak. So absolutely, I think, learning about the Holocaust, listening to survivors, definitely contributes to the fight against racism today. And one of the reasons that we set up that commemoration and that we do that work in Dudley is because it's part of a wider campaign against racism. When I became the MP for Dudley, we'd had BNP councillors, the community get you, targeted by uh, the EDL, and teaching people about where racism can lead is definitely a part of, part of that campaign. And the other thing I would say as well is, I've seen young people go to Auschwitz with Het, come back to Dudley, and really get involved in campaigns against racism. Some of them absolutely life-changing. Um, young people who've gone on to work for uh, organisations helping refugees and migrants. Now, what greater tribute could there be to Het's work and to AJR's legacy that a young person learns about racism, learns about the Holocaust, and devotes their lives to helping refugees in Britain today. I think that's a fantastic tribute to the work that you guys do. Thank and I'll let John answer the difficult question about Brexit. <laughs> <laughs> and, and to answer the question directly, uh, will Brexit be a good thing or a bad thing? Well, time will tell. 
Time okay. will tell. And people have very different views on that. But will us being in or out of the European Union impact on our ability to influence anti-Semitism elsewhere? The answer is no. The anti-Semitism will not be dealt with at a European level. Anti-Semitism in each country will be dealt with in each country. And I speak with some knowledge. I mean, I've been to Hungary, spoken in the parliament twice, challenged the Hungarian leaders. I've been to Poland to their parliament, challenged the political leaders. I've been to Lithuania, done the same thing, Latvia, done the same thing, France, Germany, Holland, Belgium. I've done the hard graft in challenging often people whose viewpoint and perspective, in my view, is very distorted and sometimes very dangerous. But that will only be solved by those challenges in that country. Mm. The idea that the Polish government will change its approach and uh, what I would call its distortion of its own history is not going to be coming from the European Union or above. Right. By definition, it's going to come only from within Poland and having that argument in a Polish context inside Poland. And, you know, it, it's part of my philosophy. The starting point for challenging anti-Semitism is that everyone should do their little bit, no more than that, but everyone should do their little bit, including everyone here on this call tonight. Do your little bit, and then as you're much more active, please do 5% more and don't underestimate the power of you doing that because people always underestimate right. their own power. A huge power if we all do 5% more. Um, but also be confident. You know, the, the general election, the story of the general election, in my view, is very simple. In Derby and in West Bromwich, Christopher Williamson and George Galloway, the two cheerleaders for the anti-Semites publicly, with a checkered history themselves on what they'd said and done over the years, were rejected by the British people to such an extent that both lost their deposit, less than 2% of the vote, humiliated. That shows that the British people reject anti-Semitism. And our job is to sort our backyard out first, this country, our locality, our own organisations, our football teams, our universities, our political parties, and then to try and assist others to do the same, be it in Hungary or Poland or France or the United States or wherever. I think we can do both. But if you all do what you're doing, and thank you for your brilliance, all of you, in doing it. I just say, don't underestimate the power of what you do, because I know that most of you do. Well, you're making a mistake. It's far more powerful than you realize, and if you've got time, do 5% more, and you'll be even more influential. Well, I... I... I think there's not much more to say after that. There could not be a, a better close to this event, I think, than that. Thank you so much for, for that, uh, John Mann. I forgot to mention in the introductions that it, it, many of you will know this, but just in case that, uh, that Lord Mann is, a, is the government's uh, special advisor on anti-Semitism. And hearing you talk so passionately about it, I feel like this topic, this issue is in very good hands in government. Um, and now that you have... Uh, you know, an ally in the House of Lords and Ian Austin as well, I feel even more uh, optimistic about our ability collectively to, to combat anti-Semitism in the manifestations that we've talked about throughout this, this talk tonight. And uh, particularly, Karen, thank you so much for your interventions as well, knowing all the work that Het is doing um, 
with young people to, you know, to educate, you know, whether it's about uh, the consequences of anti-Semitism taken to their extreme, that being the Holocaust, or as you said, sort of, you know, Jewish history and the history that leads up to it. I think that plays such an important role. And you as just a, a public figure speaking out against this is, is such a powerful thing. So thank you for all that you're doing as well. Thank you to all three of you for joining this panel. To all of those who, who joined us uh, in the, we had well over a hundred people at one point, um, which is just, Fantastic. I imagine you're hungry for your dinner now, so we, we won't uh, carry on any longer. But thank you so much for all who, who joined us. And we hope to see you at another one of our events online uh, in the very near future. Thanks, everyone.